Good day, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Five Minutes Sarcoma Talk on Uncle Daily. I'm Shushan Hosepian, your host as always. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Herbert, Herbert Lung, Associate Professor in the Department of Clinical Oncology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Deputy Medical Director of the Phase One Clinical Trials Center. Welcome, Dr. Lung, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. As you all know, last week in Barcelona took place ESMO 2024, and I hope you had a wonderful meeting uh, there. And now I asked Dr. Lung to share updates from sarcoma sessions at ESMO. So now uh, I know that you prepared some slides, and I would like to ask you to share the screen and uh, go from there. Sure, that's great, Chishan. Let me just share my screen. Um, and uh, thanks again <clears throat> for this invite. Um, the title is Five Minutes Talk. I might go a little over five minutes. There are quite a few good data uh, that was actually presented. Uh, but in any case, let's just go through this on a whirlwind tour of some of the updates uh, as well. So uh, I'm Dr. Herbert Lone from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And um, I have decided to break up the talk or this short session into three particular aspects uh, that were particularly concentrated at ESMO 2024. There were good abstracts in soft tissue sarcomas, good abstract in gists, as well as one particular abstract looking at the potential role of using next generation sequencing and molecular tumor boards uh, in sarcomas. So to begin with, the first abstract I'd like to discuss is an abstract or a project known as EREMIS, E-R-E-M-I-S-S. Which essentially is from the French sarcoma group looking at the use of a regorafinib as a maintenance treatment after first line doxorubicin chemotherapy. So, essentially, patients um, with um, prior usage of first line doxorubicin based chemotherapy were randomized into one to one fashion between the use of regorafinib at 120 milligrams per day, three days on, one, uh, three weeks on, one week off, versus placebo. And the uh, primary endpoint for this particular clinical trial was a progression free survival. Now you can see here uh, in the bottom is the actual demographics of the patients. The majority of the patients within this clinical trial had leiomyosarcomas, as well as some with synovial sarcoma and a mixture of other types of sarcomas that we routinely see in clinical practice as well. The number of patients who actually had doxorubicin-based chemotherapy or combination chemotherapy seems to be well balanced between the two arms. So to cut a long story short, this is the results indicating the fact that patients who were randomized into the regorafinib uh, um, uh, maintenance arm actually had a better progression-free survival of 5.6 months versus placebo of 3.5 months. Uh, certainly, you would expect the fact that patients who are on the regorafinib arm actually had more adverse events. Uh, but if you actually look at the number of adverse events, in actual fact, uh, they're actually quite similar. Having said that, so there are certainly more grade three uh, adverse events in the regorafinib group versus just placebo. So this potentially is a, a practice changing um, um, abstract, given the fact that now we have a potential role of using a TKI uh, as a maintenance treatment uh, after initial doxorubicin-based chemotherapy. Another study that was presented um, by Dr. Martin Broto uh, on behalf of the um, Spanish sarcoma group is the ImmunoSARC-2 study, which actually at this particular uh, juncture is a cohort looking at the use of sunitinib plus nivolumab in patients with clear cell sarcoma. Um, essentially, this is a, an open label phase two study where patients initially are treated with an induction phase with sunitinib first, and then subsequently a maintenance phase of sunitinib plus nivolumab. What you can see is a um, favorable progression-free survival over what is known in the historical cohorts and a six-month progression-free survival rate of about 51%, median progression-free survival of 7.83 months, overall survival of 17 months. Now, this is, of course, a non-randomized study, an open-label study, but based on our knowledge of clear cell sarcomas, these are actually very favorable uh, survival results, and hopefully we'll be able to move this particular treatment regimen forward for patients. Another interesting study was presented by Dr. Breland Wilkie on behalf of her colleagues, uh, looking at a combination of a CTLA-4 as well as a PD-1 inhibitor in patients with sarcomas. This is the combination study of botinsilumab as well as blastilumab. Uh, and uh, in actual fact, uh, she has presented prior data of this combination previously, but this is a larger cohort now with 52 sarcoma patients where we're seeing an overall response rate of 23%. And specifically in the patients of angiosarcomas, there's actually a response rate of up to 39%. 
More interestingly, in actual fact, specifically in the angiosarcomas group where we do expect that there is going to be some response to checkpoint inhibitors, the um, response were not only in patients with cutaneous angiosarcomas, but also in patients with visceral angiosarcomas. And this was somewhat unexpected based on previous clinical trial findings. Moreover, it does seem as though the duration of response for the responders have been very, very good. Another interesting study, and now shifting gears, is on GISTs. And this is the LEVA-GIST study, which is the use of lenvatinib in patients with advanced GISTs, essentially patients who have had prior treatment of both imatinib and sunitinib were randomized on a one-to-one -one fashion between lenvatinib versus placebo, both together with best supportive care, where the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. This was pre uh, presented by Dr. Lezerne on behalf of his colleagues at the French sarcoma group as well. And what you can see here is the median progression-free survival, again, for patients treated with lenvatinib and best supportive care was better than uh, placebo. However, in terms of uh, overall survival, there is um, benefit as well. And certainly this may be an option for patients uh, who are refractory to the first two generations uh, of tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, for GIST. Another GIST trial that was presented was presented by essentially the uh, Polish sarcoma group uh, looking at the combination of excitinib and avelumab. Excitinib being a VEGF inhibitor, avelumab, of course, being a PDL1 inhibitor in combination uh, in patients with metastatic or advanced unresectable GISTs. Again, have to have had prior treatment with imatinib and sunitinib. And patients in this open label study actually had a three month progression free survival rate of 57.1% median duration of response of 18.5 months, and a median progression-free survival of 4.6 months. What's more interesting about the study is they recruited patients of various types of GIST, which carries different types of mutations. And interestingly enough, the patients with wild-type GISTs seem to do just as well as patients with the a typical kit exon 9 or exon 11 mutation. And there, in actual fact, may open up a treatment option for patients who don't have molecularly driven GISTs and uh, being able to uh, have a good survival uh, with this particular combination treatment. So we do look forward to more expansion of this particular trial uh, later on as well. Lastly, I just want to talk about the potential role in the use of next generation sequencing and molecular tumor boards in sarcomas. Uh, this is a report, again, from the French sarcoma group looking at a project that they've been doing known as the multi sarc study, really highlighting the role of NGS in patients with uh, soft tissue sarcomas. As you know, the French sarcoma group is a very large national group where referrals for sarcomas are all centralized. And in actual fact, um, in this particular clinical trial, it is patients with um, newly diagnosed soft tissue sarcomas uh, where they're randomized to either get NGS upfront or no NGS. And in the patients who actually have NGS, also uh, have their NGS uh, reports uh, brought to a molecular tumor board, and then to identify whether or not there are potential targetable mutations, either through clinical trials or from uh, off-label use of some of the drugs that's actually registered uh, in France. And uh, this is to compare, of course, uh, patients who, after the molecular tumor board, did not identify any alterations and then continue with standard of care. In the recruitment of this particular trial, in actual fact, it's a very large trial. You can see on the bottom right-hand corner, the demographics, there are about 220 patients in each of the arms. And the most common histology, again, is lyomar sarcoma, followed by liposarcoma, as well as undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And in terms of the molecular alterations that's been found in these patients, uh, these are typical alterations that we do see in sarcomas. Certainly, uh, TP53 uh, would be something that's most common. But in terms of some of the potentially targetable mutations, of course, we're looking at MDM2 or CDK4, predominantly probably driven by the liposarcoma patients. But we also know that there are other sarcomas which carry these alterations and potentially also targetable with clinical trials of these particular agents. Overall, 47% of the NGS patients had at least one targetable mutation identified, and in actual fact, 36% of the NGS patients received targeted therapy based on next generation sequencing. So with this, um, that's really a quick uh, snapshot and summary of the uh, latest results that were presented at ESMO, and I'll be happy to discuss further.
Thank you so much for uh, sharing the updates. It was very productive and helpful uh, for our audience. And it is fascinating to see how these studies open up new possibilities, particularly uh, how we can individualize this treatment for different sarcoma types. And uh, the challenge now lies in how quickly we can translate this into practice. And uh, what are your thoughts about uh, where is the future of sarcoma research is going? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of um, interesting ideas um, as well as preliminary evidence of all these approaches. But I think one of the difficulties with sarcoma is it's still relatively rare. Uh, these are relatively small patient numbers. And I think what needs to be the steps really is to harness uh, or hone down on one or two of these ideas and really make it more international, have more involvement by the international community, and then see whether or not we could expand based on the number of patients that we have globally to try to really establish the prospective evidence evidence of some of these trials. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, collaboration is the key for uh, sarcoma uh, research. And uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Lung, uh, for this comprehensive uh, overview. And uh, for our audience, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, everyone who joined. And um, until next time, stay well and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.